Welcome to Chill Skills Sporland Tech Talks. The topic for this episode is supermarket metering devices, distributors. This is the eighth, if I recall correctly, in a series of presentations that will follow the agenda of the old supermarket seminars. In the past, Sporland had a team of professionals on a supermarket team that went around the country to facilitate these presentations in person. With this Tech Talk entry, we're bringing the supermarket seminar concept back and hopefully servicing a bigger audience in the process. Just so you know, here's a shameless promotion for the next webinar we plan to do in July. July 16th, 2020, we will discuss methods of temperature control, beginning with the use of solenoid valves and thermostats. Also, just so that you know, we're going to be putting a survey out on our blog regarding refrigeration and refrigeration applications. We'd like for you to take a look at that. Might take you all of five minutes to cover it. Just a few instructions here. If the speaker on your computer doesn't work, you can simply dial in with your phone. There should have been a phone number somewhere on the invitation that you originally received for the webinar. But in the event that you can't locate that, we've, we have placed the number for you right here so that's handy if you need to dial in. And as we move along through the, the webinar, and you have questions, you're welcome to type those questions into the Q&A window. We plan to answer questions as best we can in this live format. Generally, we run out of time. Uh, and if that happens, we'll eventually post answers to all of the questions online so that you can go back and reference those. However, most of the time, if you just kind of hang on, there's a good bet that we'll answer your question during the course of the webinar itself. And just so you know, this webinar is being recorded. You can always be able to go back and take a listen to it. It'll be on Facebook Live and then eventually on our Sporland YouTube channel. And should we run into any broadcasting problems, because we've been experiencing a few connectivity issues today, again, we will record this. You can go back and listen to it. In the event we have a catastrophic failure, we'll reschedule this. Hello, I'm Jim Jansen, Senior Application Engineer for the Sporland Application Team. That's me on the left. That would be like this guy. And joining me today is John Whithouse. John is the Senior Principal Engineer for the Sporland Division. He's also a published author, consultant, and as I have said many times in the past, all around, extra smart guy. We're excited to have John with us today. Say hi, John. Good afternoon, Jim and to everyone. If you have any follow-up questions or feedback, you may contact us by email or contact the Sporland Technical Support Team at svdtechsupport at parker.com. You can always call 636 area code 239-1111 for our general HQ number, or you may call tech support directly by dialing 636-392-3906. We'll show this information to you again at the end. We are continuing the discussion on metering devices and distributors. And guess what? The focus today will be on distributors as highlighted on the slide. Here are just a few examples of Sporland distributors and distributor accessories. Sizes and capacities are available for many applications. Sporland distributors are available with sweat and flare style connections as you can see sweat versions here, and then we're also displaying a SAE flare style. We also have side connections versions available for defrost and hot gas applications as we depict right here. An example of a removable nozzle and the accompanying retainer ring are also on display. The slide also depicts a complementary product used with distributors known as the Auxiliary Side Connector, or ASC. We'll speak more about this little gadget later today, and then again when we cover discharge bypass applications. For the most part, distributors can be installed in virtually any position, even though there may be some exceptions to this statement. So why use a distributor? And we'll get to that in just a minute. As we have mentioned in past webinars, the basic vapor compression refrigeration cycle consists of four primary components. The compressor, the condenser, 
the metering device, which we're showing here as a thermostatic expansion valve, and then of course, the evaporator. The refrigerant distributor is an important device connected to the outlet of the metering device. We've highlighted it here. Evaporators with multiple refrigerant circuits require the use of refrigerant distributors. Now, John, we're not talking about a wholesaler that sells refrigerant. Well, we could be, but we're not. That's right. But we're talking about that chunk of brass with holes drilled into That's it. That's right. We want that refrigerant to be distributed as effectively and evenly through the coil as possible. Oh, now you're getting ahead of us. Now you're just moving way too fast. Sorry. The, the outlet of the distributor is fabricated with the appropriate outlet circuits in order to provide a flow path for refrigerant to each corresponding evaporator coil circuit sort of what you kind of just said. But that's not all. The distributor is designed to supply equal percentages of refrigerant, liquid, and vapor to each of those evaporator coil circuits. Now that's a real issue, because even though the refrigerant may be 100% liquid and even subcooled, perhaps? Indeed. Is that right? Before it enters the metering device right here, it's going to change phase and flash resulting in two phases. What are those two phases, John? Liquid and vapor. That's kind of what I was gonna guess that. Excellent. At, and, and as it leaves the metering device. Now, let's talk about that two phase flow issue for just a minute. If a simple header as depicted in this slide is used to divide, divide the flow into each of the evaporator circuits, those circuits will not receive equal amounts of refrigerant. Let's look at the examples. Gravity and friction will come into play. And like for instance here, the lower circuits of the evaporator will invariably receive the most liquid resulting in punting or starving problems. Does that sound like a likelihood? That's correct. The upper circuits, as we show here, will likely be starred for refrigerant, thus reducing the effect effectiveness of the evaporator. But people say, gosh, uh, manifolds or headers are used all the time in refrigeration applications. John, where can we successfully use a header type of arrangement? When you're bringing flows back together, when you're taking the flows from those individual circuits and bringing them back into a common suction, a header or manifold is very effective. Okay, and then what's, what's different though about the state of the refrigerant in that instance? In that instance, the refrigerant is single phase. Ah, that's the big deal. It will be liquid or it will be vapor and it will not be two phase flow. I think that's the big deal, right? That there. is the big deal, indeed. So if we've got to achieve proper distribution, the liquid portion of the two phase flow must be divided equally to each evaporator coil circuit. Since, a, since the liquid does the majority of the refrigeration, that's important. So what's the solution to that two phase flow situation that we have as a result of the flow flashing as it comes through the metering device? Well, we've got liquid and vapor, as you can see there at the outlet of the metering device. We wanna mix the liquid and the vapor portions of the refrigerant flow and maintain that homogeneous mixture until equal portions of that flow are divided into each evaporator circuit. Now, we've got this neat little appropriately sized nozzle that helps to create high pressure drop and velocity and is imposed on that two-phase flow. What does that do, John? That causes those two phases to mix together, right? Indeed, it does. It helps keep the phases mixed and facilitates good distribution. Wow, that sounds really complicated. That that mixture is then introduced into each evaporator circuit via the circuit tubes. The nozzle and circuit are all critically sized distributor features for a given application. Optimum performance is obtained when the distributor is mounted directly to the outlet of the metering device. In this case, the thermostatic expansion valves outlet. If this cannot occur, it can be connected to the valve outlet by means of a straight length of tubing or pipe, but it really shouldn't exceed two feet in length. 
Uh, but that, that two foot in length ought to be straight runs without elbows or other impediments to high velocity flow. Of course, and you know this, John, there are exceptions to that all the time. Indeed there are. But, but what happens when you do that? The installation, there's always some sort of compromise there. Uh, that's right. We want to stack the odds in favor of us getting a good distribution job. If we have appropriately sized distributors, they'll also contribute to good oil return or lubricant return, capacity optimization and efficiency. Consider this, if the evaporator coil is evenly supplied with refrigerant, like I said, the odds are stacked in favor of obtaining even superheat control by the thermostatic expansion valve or the EEV, however you've decided to meter the refrigerant. If you'll note the position of the distributor in this slide, we have said you can install it in most any position. This vertical installation does benefit from the effects of gravity and it can help provide better distribution if the distributor is not directly connected to the TEV outlet. When selecting a TEV for use with a Sporlin distributor, an externally equalized valve must be used to compensate for the distributor pressure drop. The distributor pressure drop also reduces the available pressure drop across the TEV. So that means you need to know the distributor pressure drop before selecting the thermostatic expansion valve. You absolutely do. If, if there is no additional letter indicated following the body style designation and refrigerant letter code on the valve, and if the valve is only supplied with an inlet and outlet fitting, that valve is said to be internally equalized. Now this equalization moniker is a little bit confusing. This simply means the evaporator pressure at the inlet of the evaporator will be exerted on the underside of the diaphragm of the expansion valve, directly opposing the valve's bulb pressure through an internal passageway right here in the valve box. Now, if the valve is externally equalized, a letter E is added to the nomenclature. This signifies that in addition to the valve's inlet and outlet connections, there is a third small diameter fitting on the valve body. This third connection allows the pressure from a, from a point external to the valve to be sourced as an operating force. A small diameter tube from the outlet of the evaporator is connected to the external equalizer fitting on the valve. Pressure from the outlet side of the evaporator is then transmitted to the underside of the valve diaphragm to oppose the valve's bulb pressure. Many valves, many valves are supplied as externally equalized versions. Now here you can see many evaporator designs have significant pressure drop from inlet to outlet. In this particular example, you can see that the inlet pressure is 75 PSI and the outlet over here is 55. That's got a 20 pound drop across it. Now, granted, for simplification, we have not shown a distributor. But if mistakenly used, an internally equalized TEV would allow the higher evaporator inlet pressure to act on the underside of the diaphragm and since this is a closing force on the valve, the TV would respond by decreasing refrigerant flow, correspondingly increasing the superheat. In the depicted 404A system, the saturated temperature corresponding to the measured suction pressure of 55 PSIG here is 20 degrees. Now, if we do a superheat calculation, John, that means the evaporator has to develop 23 degrees of superheat at the bulb location. An internally equalized valve in this particular example is going to starve the evaporator coil. Indeed it right? would. Right? Yes, it would. That's not good. That's is not it? good. That's, that's really a bad thing. That's not good. You want to utilize as much of that coil surface as you possibly can. And that's not going to let it happen. It's not going to let and it happen. And all because we're sampling a closing force back over here with that internally equalized valve. So how are we going to fix that? Well, a TV with an external equalizer overcomes this problem. 
by allowing the pressure at the outlet of the evaporator near the bulb location right here to be supplied to the underside of the diaphragm. This pressure derived from a location near the sensing bulb of the valve allows it to control refrigerant flow to maintain a normal amount of evaporator superheat. Because of the terminology, an external equalizer is sometimes misunderstood. Just keep this in mind, it is simply an external method for the TV to sense evaporator pressure. Now, right behind the thermostatic expansion valve or whatever metering device you happen to be using, the distributor exhibits the most pressure drop in the system. Now, now, now wait a minute, before you jump to conclusions here and think the distributor pressure drop really doesn't reduce system capacity. No. No, it doesn't, does, does it, John? It, it does, does not. No. It does not. No. In fact, it helps keep the thermostatic diaphragm case on a, on a TV warmer than the sensing bulb. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And, and this can help prevent the potential for something called charge migration on systems that are using thermostatic expansion valves that have a maximum operating pressure type thermostatic charge or MOP. Mm -hmm. And finally, in the case, externally equalized TV can control a more desirable 10 degrees of superheat versus the internally equalized version of the valve. Now here's another interesting thing that I ought to bring up. Each distributor should be fed by its own TEV or other metering device. They should be made in one to one. Now, size matters. Now, I'm not trying to make a joke here. I'm being serious. And check distributor sizing. The distributor plays an important role in the proper operation of the TEV and the function of the evaporator. And here's some simple questions asked. Is the nozzle selection correct? Is the tube selection correct? John, if we're doing a, a refrigerant retrofit, how important are those, are those parameters? Well, they're real darn important. They're very important. Well, I didn't mean to wake you up over there, but I just thought, you know, I'd engage you a little bit and have you join. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Sorry. Yeah. Also important to note that liquid temperature and that's the liquid entering the metering device or TV. Distributor performance certainly varies with that liquid temperature. Absolutely, Greatly. absolutely it does. Uh, in fact, supermarket refrigeration systems, yeah, for that matter, others, other re refrigeration systems as well, oftentimes operate over wide ranges of conditions. I mean, a supermarket's gonna run 365 days a year, right? And it Correct. might be an environment where the liquid temperature and even the evaporator temperatures might vary. Very hot summertime conditions to very cold wintertime conditions. Supermarkets have to stay operating through all those conditions. So what's a good thing to do? We ought to check the distributor nozzle and tube selection for the entire range of system operating conditions. Like say for systems employing capacity control like for compressors, the distributor nozzle and tube combination should be checked for both the minimum and maximum load conditions. Now, I bet you know about a neat tool that we have that, that all our customers can use to do that. What's that tool called, John? That would be Sporland's virtual engineer selection tool. And, and, and what's a real interesting thing about that is it's, it is a free web-based tool that you can access from sporland.com that uh, incorporates um, all, the, uh, all the math that was in our legacy selection tool that uh, is widely used and widely trusted throughout the industry. Uh, it uses the same math and makes selections based on the same parameters. Um, but it adds a lot of features and includes a lot of newer products than our legacy tool did. That's, that's great. Now, it, for those of you that are familiar with it, if you like the concept of it, you can thank me, you're welcome. If you use it and you think it's, it's difficult to use, well, you can blame John. We'll be covering that on a future webinar, in fact. Mm -hmm. This image shows an actual cutaway of a distributor. Here you can see the body of this, the distributor, here's the body. The retaining ring, 
the nozzle disc and then the orifice that's drilled in it. And the drilled passage is uh, the circuit passageways. There's, I think this is like a 10 circuit distributor. Again, nozzle selection, that's what we're talking about right here, that opening and tube size selection are critical features of the distributor. Now let's, let's, let's just review this slide briefly for some troubleshooting items. Let's say the TV is hunting or what is this thing? Odd front pattern? Is that talking about like frost patterns on the evaporator coil, that sort of thing? Is that an odd Indeed. front pattern? They're not Indeed. talking about me standing out in front of a building and saying that's an odd front pattern. They're not talking about no. something. Okay. No, I don't think so. Un anyway. Uneven air distribution or airflow can cause problems. Poor refrigerant distribution because of circuit loading or nozzle size all can lead back to a problem, say, maybe with a distributor selection. Now, circuit tube restriction is kind of an interesting thing because let's say a leak check of the evaporator call will not reveal a plug circuit. I mean, who would have thought? Correct. Uh, each circuit really needs to be individually checked with maybe a wire probe, an air jet, or if you want to get fancy, uh, a flow meter mm -hmm. to detect for a restricted circuit following the brazing operation. And if you've never brazed one of these up, you really don't have an appreciation for how easy that is to plug one of these circuits with solder. Now, there are times when folks will intentionally plug one or more distributor outlets because the correctly configured distributor is not available. And we're gonna say maybe that's not the best idea. However, if it's absolutely necessary to plug a circuit, it should be done symmetrically, and meaning you should plug a circuit on each side of the distributor outlet. Like for instance, this is a 10 circuit distributor. If you needed to create an eight circuit distributor, you'd plug two holes. Correct. Never just plug one. We'd rather you don't Correct. plug any. Here's a little animation that we're gonna show. It will show first the outlet circuit passageways, then it'll spin back around, the, there's a cutaway. And you can see the flow through past the nozzle and out the internal passageways. And then we'll spin that around. You can see the extraction holes, the retainer ring's been removed and that whole nozzle disc pulls out. And then you'll see it reinserted and animation's done. Here's a complementary device that's typically cataloged with the distributor product line. It's known as the auxiliary side connector, or abbreviated ASC. It is a convenience device that simplifies the necessary piping modifications when adding discharge gas or hot gas by properly selected. distributor can be removed and subsequently placed into the inlet of the ASC. And you'll see here that we've removed that nozzle disc and we've got it positioned over here. Sporland assemblies are typically supplied with what are called extraction holes. I mentioned that earlier. You can see those extraction holes right there. Now in this particular example, we're showing the extraction holes on the nozzle disc so you can see them in an actual installation, that nozzle disc would be spun 180 degrees around so that they would be accessible from the inlet of the ASC or the distributor for that matter. And we've just shown them here for illustration purposes. You, you reassemble that, you wanna make sure that they're in a position so that you can utilize them in the future should you ever need to do so. If all of the components are selected appropriately, the thermostatic expansion valve, the ASC, and the distributor would all be close coupled as you see in this example. Again, we're trying to stack the odds in your favor for a successful distribution job. As with side connection style distributors, we briefly showed that to you on the introductory slide. The ASC allows hot gas or liquid refrigerant in the reverse cycle to bypass the nozzle disc. In addition, the two-phase refrigerant flowing from the TEV passes through the nozzle in a nozzle tube extension that you can see right here in this cutaway. 
This extended tube eliminates any interference upon the refrigerant flow from the TEV by the hot gas as it enters through the side connection. It helps to manage the refrigerant flow streams far better than a simple plumbing T could ever do. The extended tube is supported by a perforated web. You can see that here. Allowing hot gas or liquid refrigerant in the reverse cycle to flow through the ASC with minimal pressure drop. Now, distributor tube sizing. If you're gonna move hot gas through the device, you'd run through the selection process just as you would for a normal cooling application. You do just like we do in pretty much any situation you choose the next larger size. With, AS, with an auxiliary side connection, if bypass flow does not exceed 75% of the design load, tube size for cooling should be adequately big enough. Now, John, I'm gonna ask you, are you getting any questions coming in to us? I have had a few questions. Uh, are, are any of them of a nature that we ought to answer online? Well, we got a little bit of time, here is, here provided we don't lose our connection. Here is an interesting one. Uh, I was just going to uh, just going to point this one out to you. Yes. We have a question that says. You need to speak up, John, so people can says, hear you. I mean, they're right. way out there and God knows where. Well, this is true. I'd better talk about Yeah, you got to talk up. Yeah. All right. Um, can unused circuits on the distributor be looped together instead of plugged if the correct distributor is not available? So, in other words, rather than simply, we talk just a moment ago about- yeah, yeah, I was just talking about it here where plugging. you can kind of see the cutaway. Right. So could they be looped together? It's a very interesting question. Yeah, so what do you think about that? I would think that it would have essentially the same effect. You think? I would think, but I have actually not seen that done. So- um, Some know. of the interesting things I've seen done with distributors, I've seen them plugged. Mm -hmm. I've seen some people that only plug one, one can, one outlet circuit, that's a bad idea. I, I've seen people drill nozzle disc uh, to make a larger orifice size. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things as far as modifications in the field that I have witnessed, some of them with varying degrees of success. Mm -hmm. If any other questions that might be merit some discussion for us at this point that you should bring up. And if you don't, then I'm good. I think we're good for now. All right. Well, then what I'm going to do is say, if you have questions, we're always here. Sporlin is always here to assist you with air conditioning and refrigerant flow control needs. You can reach us by calling the general number 636-239-1111. This number will provide options for you to get to customer service or tech support. You can also dial tech support directly on the number that we show on the slide. You can contact us via email, and we're always here in a 24-7 manner at sporlin.com for product literature, for virtual engineer that John mentioned, and even more things. You can sign up for our newsletter. You can see new product releases, events, other training work that we're going to do, new product literature. You can stay connected with us and follow us. You can watch presentations on YouTube. We're putting more and more videos out on YouTube and eventually this program as well will be on not only Facebook or, but our YouTube channel for your use. If you haven't asked us a question and you have one you wanna to pose to us, you can type it into the Q&A window. If you're looking at via, via Facebook Live, you can type your questions into the comments area. John, do you have any other questions coming in to us that we ought to address? Uh, yes, we actually, okay. we actually right. do have one here. Okay, go for it. Um, if a TEV and an EPR evaporator pressure regulator. I've heard of those. Okay, I thought you might have. Yeah, maybe once. Uh, are in the same system, does the EPR valve have more control? And, oh, okay. I well, think, I think. If you briefly want to handle that now, keep in mind okay. that is. Okay. Doing a distributor webinar. This is true. This is true, um, but we have to have a, we need to have a distributor in between the TEV and the EPR. Yes, this, yeah, well, let's say that you do. Typically, yeah. typically we would. So I think in that case, um, I think that they are really independent from one another. The TEV and distributor 
meter refrigerant into the va evaporator. And the EPR is a back pressure device that controls the uh, pressure inside the evaporator. And um, they really are not dependent on one another, uh, nor do they actually affect one another that much. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, that's really a good segue into what I'm going to mention here. We do have an upcoming Sporlin webinar where we're going to talk about methods of temperature control. The first one that we're going to cover is going to be solenoid valves and thermostats. But as we move through that, that method, the concept of EPRs and how EPRs work with TEDs and how they both should be adjusted is going to come into play during those discussions and we'll go into depth with that. So join us on July 16th when we cover that subject. Got any other questions we ought to cover? I do not. All right. That being the case, this concludes our webinar on refrigerant distributors. Thank you for completing another Sporlin Chill Skills Tech Talk. Thank you.